tonight's message. We're going to be doing a series. We looked, we talked a little bit about God's promises this morning. And in the morning, we're looking at basically what are known as the I am statements, where Jesus tells who he is. But I think a good companion study in the same book, book of John, is where God, Jesus Christ, says, I will. Just flat out promises of what Jesus Christ will do. And does God always keep his promises? Yes. Absolutely. In fact, let's go to Hebrews chapter 6. Good reminder from the book of Hebrews that God always keeps his promises. Hebrews chapter 6, we're going to start in verse 13. And this is talking about when God made a promise to Abraham that he would make him a great nation. How many kids did he and Sarai have at that time? Zero. Next time God came and said, I'm going to make you a great nation as the sands of the sea. How many kids do they have? Zero. Third time. <laughs> but God kept making that promise, and it says Abraham believed him, counted unto righteousness. Did he still have doubts at times? Did he even try to uh, fix it himself? <laughs> yeah. So, not always 100%, but he, he says he believed him, and does God, did God keep his promise to Abraham? Yeah, did they have a son? Did he tell him to kill that son? But he trusted God's promise still, didn't he? <laughs> so, and that's where we need to be. We need to trust him no matter what, no matter the situation, no matter how long it takes. We know God will always keep his promises. That's what this is all about in Hebrews chapter 6, verse 13. For when God made promise to Abraham, because he could swear by no greater, he swear by himself, right? Swear by his own character. He cannot break a promise saying, Surely blessing I will bless thee, and multiplying I will multiply thee. And so, after he had patiently endured, he obtained the promise. I always like passages like that, because if you know the story, he was rather impatient. <laughs> but how, what does God always look at? God always looked at the end. He always looks at the heart. He always looks at that, right? Even when we make mistakes all along the way, do we get credit for how it turns out? <laughs> Abraham certainly did. So many people in the Bible did. Had patiently endured, he obtained the promise. For men verily swear by the greater, and an oath for confirmation is to them an end of all strife, wherein God, willing more abundantly to show unto the heirs of promise the immutability, unchanging nature of his counsel, confirmed it by an oath, that by two immutable things, unchanging things, in which it was impossible for God to lie, we might have a strong consolation who have fled for refuge to lay hold upon the hope set before us. And he turns it around there. It comes back to us, right? We have hope because we put our faith in God's what? Promises. And can God change his character? No. Can God change the way he deals with us? The answer is no. <laughs> can he go back on Can anybody stop him from doing it? Satan's been trying for a long time. To stop him from getting what he wants, right? But cannot. By his strength, by his character, and by his word, we can know his promises will be kept. So when Jesus, in the passage we're going to look at, says, I will, does he mean it? Can we bank on it? Absolutely. Absolutely. In fact, let's go to the first one. John chapter 2, verse 18. Now, this is right after what is known as the first purification of the temple. This is at the beginning of Jesus' ministry. We know, in fact, we just went through Easter. We know that after he rode into the city and they were saying, Hosanna, and all of that, we know he went and purified the temple, right? Come to the tables, clearing it out. He, did, he also did that at the beginning of his ministry. After his first miracle in Cana, and he came then down to Jerusalem for the first Passover of his ministry. What did he do first? He went into the temple and cleared them all out. Clearly it didn't take. <laughs> but how many probably believe they were there the next day? Yeah, <laughs> probably. They didn't really learn from it. So, the, of course, everybody's like, what are you doing? What gives you some profit from 
Galilee, right? <laughs> Some authority to go here and overturn tables and run people out. What gives you that authority? And let's look starting in verse 18. Then answered the Jews and said unto him, What sign showest thou unto us, seeing that thou doest these things? Give us a sign that shows you have this authority. Jesus answered and said unto them, Destroy this temple, and in three days I will what? Raise it up. I will raise up. Now, I do find it interesting that at his trial, this was one of the charges against him. They got witnesses to say, hey, I remember him saying he was going to destroy the temple of God and then build it up again in three days, right? So they remembered this. They didn't remember that they weren't supposed to be money changing and stuff in the temple, but they did remember this statement, right? I mean, this is a picture of mankind, isn't it? <laughs> now, what did he mean by tear down the temple and the third day he would raise it? What is he saying he will raise up here? Well, fortunately, John was written later <laughs> after all the things happened, and he gives us an answer. Verse 20, then said the Jews, 40 and six years was this temple in the in building, and wilt thou t uh, rear it up in three days? And he spake of the temple of his what? Body. He tear this temple down. Mm -hmm. And by the way, were the Jews going to tear down that temple? Yeah. 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 They're going to put that temple to death, but on the third day, he promises to what? Raise it. Is that a bold statement? Now, we look back on it 2,000 years. How many just accept the fact, yeah, Jesus will be dead? How big a deal is that? How big a promise is that? How impossible is that promise to keep? <laughs> On his own strength, of his own being, can, can, how many, who else could make that statement? I will. And by the way, since he's God, he can say stuff like that, can he? Mm -hmm. And he cannot change, and he will. And he will raise it up the third day. Verse 22. When therefore he was risen from the dead... <laughs> His disciples, like John who's writing this, remembered that he had said this unto them, and they believed the scripture and the word which Jesus had said. So it goes all the very beginning of his ministry, first real trip to Jerusalem as part of his ministry, and he says this. It wasn't going to be until three and a half years later that it happens. But John's looking back on that and saying, okay, now we know what he's talking about. He was promising that when he died, he will rise again, right? And he will raise it up. And did he? That's a, yeah, it's an amazing thing. He kept that promise. In fact, let's go to 1 Corinthians chapter 15. Anybody know what the 1 Corinthians 15 is known as? What chapter? The resurrection chapter. Yeah, 1 Corinthians got good, you know, the love chapter. Resurrection chapter. Yeah. The chapters, right? <laughs> First Corinthians 15. Yes. And the answer is yes. He said, I will, and he did. Right? Moreover, brethren, I declare unto you the gospel which I preached unto you, which also you have received, and wherein you stand. This is the gospel, isn't it? The gospel is that we are sinners, but Christ died for us and what? Rose the third day. His temple was destroyed, but he raised it up the third day. By which also we are saved, if you keep in memory what I preached unto you, unless you have believed in vain. For I delivered unto you, first of all, that which also I received. How that? Christ, what? died for our sins according to the scriptures. This was planned long before, right? This is Old Testament. Read Isaiah. Read Daniel. You knew he was going to die for our sins according to the scriptures. And that he was buried. And that he what? Rose again the third day according to the scriptures. That also is Old Testament, isn't it? That he would die, but he would then rise again. And how do we know? Well, he was seen of Cephas, also known as Peter, right? Then of the twelve. After that, he was seen above 500 brothers at once, of whom the greater part remain unto this present, but some are fallen asleep. So you may not be able to go see Peter and talk to him or one of the disciples. Go talk. They're busy. But go talk to one of those 500 people. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It, it, it's your local, you know. Merchant, it's your other fishermen. I don't know who these people are, but you can go talk to them. Yeah, they were probably going around talking to them. Yeah, I mean, 
talk to them. They're alive and well. Some, some are died, but most of them are still around. Go talk to them. After that, he was seen of James, which is his half-brother, and then of all the apostles. So he went and talked to all of those, all those leaders of the early church. And last of all, he was seen of who? Me. Who's the me? Paul. Paul, Paul himself saw him, that skeptic, <laughs> that one who hated the name of Jesus, who wanted to rid the earth of the name of Jesus, saw Jesus, right? As one born out of due time, for I am the least of the apostles that am not, not meet. I'm not worthy to be called an apostle because I persecuted the church of God, but by grace of God, I am what I am. That's such a great statement, isn't it? <laughs> None of us deserve to be Christians. None of us deserve what he does through us in this world, but by his grace we are who we are, right? Sinners who are saved by the grace of God and used by him by the grace of God. And his grace which is bestowed upon me was not in vain, but I labored more abundantly than they, than they all, yet not I, but the grace of God which was within me. And this is important because if Jesus Christ is not risen from the dead, then he's going to say what? Our work is in vain. But since he is risen from the dead, we have hope for a future, right? And if we have hope for a future, then we have a purpose now. Right? And he says, I've taken that and I've done that. Therefore, whether it were I or they, so we preach and so you believe. This has been the message of the church. The church has been the message of who? Jesus. Right? You preach who? Jesus. Died, risen, coming again. Right? <laughs> you preach Jesus. He is our hope and he is these things. He is risen from the dead. Now, verse 12, now if Christ be preached that he rose from the dead, how say some among you that there is no resurrection of the dead? Who was saying that? Well, large parts of the world. Because the primary philosophy of the world, yeah, the Romans were the government. The Romans were the army. Our Romans were the strength, the commerce. But who was the philosophers still? The Greeks. Still a very much a Greek mindset. And according to Greeks, there is what? Nothing after you die. It's, a, it's amazing they got anything accomplished. Because I don't know why you would care <laughs> to do anything. If all you do is just, you just die and you know, feed trees and bugs. I mean, that's, that's basically all you're good for. Right? But that's what they, and that was the predominant. And that even was sinking into the Jewish mindset. Because a lot of the Greek philosophy and stuff, because of all the problems they had, <laughs> being run over by Greek after Greek after Greek for 400 years, uh, they, they started thinking that way too. So he's trying to get across to these Greeks in Corinth, and even the Jews in Corinth too, say, hey, listen guys, there is a resurrection of the dead, because if there isn't, then Jesus isn't risen. Verse 13, but if there is no resurrection of the dead, then Christ is not risen. If Christ be not risen, then our preaching is vain. And your faith also is what? worthless, it's vain, it's empty. Yea, and we are found false witnesses of God because we have testified of God that he raised up Christ. Whom he raised not up, if so be the dead rise not. Jesus said, I will raise up. If he did not raise up, then he's a what? Liar. <laughs> which means he's not what? God, <laughs> which means his sacrifice is what? Damn. Worthless. <laughs> you get the picture here? How important is that statement, I will raise up? And then to do it. That proves so much, doesn't it? Proves who he is. Verse 17, and if Christ be not raised, your faith is in vain, you are yet in your sins. Then they also which are fallen asleep, those who have died in Christ, are just what? Perished, just gone. If in this life only we have hope in Christ, we are of all men most miserable. What are we doing here? Why, why, why are we denying ourselves anything? Why are we sacrificing at all? Why are we spending time? Because if this life is all it is, then... You might as well just be as comfortable as you can. <laughs> you might as well just, you know, do whatever because nothing matters. But does it? Why? Verse 20. 
but now is Christ risen from the dead and become the first fruits of them that slept, those who have died, right? So when Jesus said, I will raise up, and again, how early is this in his ministry? <laughs> and he repeated it. In fact, even before he was going to Jerusalem to die, what did he tell his disciples? I'm going to go there. They are going to kill me. And on the third day, I will rise. So go to Galilee and wait for me. They didn't do any of that. <laughs> right? Mm -hmm. So Jesus said, I will raise up. And he rose. Right? Mm -hmm. Very important. Important to our faith. Important to just reality. Right? Mm -hmm. This is what it is. Now, is that all he said he would raise up? What does verse 20 also talk about? Not just himself, but what? He will be the first fruits of others who have slept. So when he says, I will raise up, he also means who? Everybody that believes. Us. So let's go to John chapter 6. Now, John chapter 6 starts with the feeding of the 5,000, which, again, the reason Jesus did those kind of miracles and did that was not just to have compassion, which he did, but also so they might know that he is who? God, their king, the Christ, as we talked about this morning. They may know he is those things. Now, we know the next day. Everybody was looking for him, not because he did the miracle, not because they wanted to come worship him, not because they wanted to hear more from him who is their king, but they were hungry. Thinking only of their what? Bellies. Bellies. But what does Jesus say repeatedly as he's talking to them that next day? Verse 40. And this is the will of him that sent me. And who sent Jesus Christ? God the Father. That everyone which sees the Son, him, and believes on him may have everlasting life, and I will what? Raise him up at the last day. It's God's will that everybody believe in Jesus Christ as their Savior, and anybody who does, he will what? Raise them up at the last day. Verse 44. No man can come to me except the Father which has sent me draw him. And I will what? Raise him up at the last day. So it's not by our will. It's not by our intelligence. It's not because we understand, but because we are called by who? Called by God, his Holy Spirit, convicting us and bringing us. And if we will just receive, what will happen? We will be raised up in the last day. Verse 54. Anybody want to guess what it's going to say? <laughs> Whoso eateth my flesh and drinketh my blood hath eternal life, and I will raise him up at the last day. Now, does that mean literally eating his flesh and drinking his blood? No, no. But it is consuming him, believing in him, taking him into your life, right? If you do that, he will what? Raise you up in the last day. So if you allow the blood of Jesus Christ to wash you clean, you, he will what? Raise you up in the last day. So is there hope for the future? Not just now in knowing that Jesus Christ is risen, but hope for us in the future, right? Now, how did people receive that news? They didn't understand. Verse 59, these things said he in the synagogue as he taught in Capernaum. Many, therefore, of his disciples, when they had heard this, said, uh, this is a hard saying. Who can hear it? Now, a lot of times we focus on the... He's talking about eating and drinking flesh and blood, right? But what has he said three times <laughs> that would also be very hard for them to understand? I will raise them up in the last days. That idea, too, was so foreign to them. Especially up in Capernaum. Capernaum was dominated by the Greeks <laughs> and the Romans. And those, I mean, just that whole area was just inundated with them. And again, that would be hard for them to really get their minds around, too. Because they just had a hard time with it, this whole idea of resurrection and what happens and things like that. They believed in God and things like that, but they, just, they, they really had a hard time what it meant to be risen again, right? So they just said, we don't understand. Verse 61, when Jesus knew in himself that, they, that his disciples, his followers, not his 
12 disciples, but his followers murmured at it. He said, does this offend you? What if you shall see the Son of Man ascend up where he was before? What if I rose? What if I rose from the dead and then rose up into heaven physically? Would you get it then? Now, by that statement, what, if, what is he really pointing at as the problem that they're having? It's not with the eating of the flesh and drinking of the blood. It's what? Rise where? <laughs> Raise what? <laughs> What are you talking about? He says, okay, well, if you see me rise from the dead and then rise up and go into heaven physically, then you'll get it, right? No, they won't. <laughs> they really won't. It is the spirit, verse 63, it is the spirit that quickeneth, makes alive. The flesh profits nothing. The words that I speak unto you, they are spirit and they are life, but there are some of you that believe not. They just could not believe all. They couldn't get past the physical, right? The physical says what? I need bread now. If I don't get bread now, I die. And then I'm what? Dead. <laughs> He's on a whole spiritual level. And no, if you spiritually accept me, then I will give you life and I will raise up your spirit, but also your flesh. That's an amazing statement, isn't it? That is what I will do. And where does it culminate? Verse 66. From that time, many of his disciples went back and walked no more with him. That's a very sad statement, isn't it? In fact, even one of his inner circle of 12, Judas, even he at that point still did not what? Believe. Still looking for that physical world. Still, still thinking about that. Kingdom here. Prophet things now. And he couldn't get his mind around what he was really offering. And how important is him offering eternal life? Yeah. How long are you going to live here? Uh -huh. I know some people in the room think it's way too long already. <laughs> <laughs> that goes to a conversation earlier. You don't have to worry about that. <laughs> now, well, yeah, 100 years? How many would say 100 years is a long time on this earth? Yes. Yeah. But it goes by really fast. Yeah, and a hundred years, hundred years serving God, being His child, and it's a wonderful thing, isn't it? How long is eternity? <laughs> That's so much more, isn't it? We're going to deal with this physical world for a hundred years in this state, but then comes what? Eternal life. What happens then? What's going to, and what is he saying? If you put your faith in him and rest in his grace, he will raise you up in the last days. Amen. Though we may die physically, mm -hmm. our soul goes on, doesn't it? Yes. And we will be resurrected. In fact, what does he really mean by that? Let's go to 1 Corinthians chapter 15 again. What does it mean to raise us up? What does resurrection mean? So I remember having dinner once and we were talking uh, about what's going on in heaven. And that there are souls. That your souls are in heaven right now, right? Not bodies, souls, right? And Joe, perplexed. What was he, about five? Four, five? Three, maybe. Maybe three. Like, it was just a bunch of puddles. Because <laughs> it's hard to get your mind around, right? Souls versus bodies, right? What, what's going on there, right? What really happens when he says he will raise us up? And by the way, if he says he will, he will what? He will. In fact, we know because he said he'd raise himself up and did. <laughs> so, and if he did, he will also do for us, right? But what will it look like? Let's go to First Corinthians chapter 15, starting at verse 21. 1 Corinthians 15, 21. For since by man came death, and what man is that? Adam. By Adam came death. Now, I'm going to sit there and say, well, wait a minute, what about Eve? The Bible is very clear. She was deceived. Adam sinned. Sin nature is handed down generation by generation through the man. It is all Bob's fault. <laughs> that his kids are the way they are. 
Which is important because it just shows you the great planning of God because uh, what did Jesus not have? A human father that would pass down a sin nature. So that's why that was so important. A virgin birth was so important. He's got it all figured out, okay? <laughs> it's a perfect plan. So by one man, Adam, by his sin, came death. By man came also the resurrection of the dead. And that man is the second Adam known as who? Jesus, Jesus Christ, who came and by them can bring back life. Because we ate of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, because of sin, the wages of sin is what? Death. 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 But God offers Eternal life. life, resurrection from the dead. For as in Adam all die, even so in Christ shall all be made what? Alive. But every man in his own order, Christ the first fruits, afterward they that are Christ at his coming. Okay. So there's an order to it. Christ first. And by the way, if that happened, do we know the second part's going to happen? Absolutely. Okay. So all those who have died, Jesus Christ died, he physically rose again. What has happened to every Christian after that period? Bodies are on the ground, bodies are dead cremated, lost at sea, doesn't matter what they look like, what condition they're in, that those all, all those bodies are, are, are resting, right? They're asleep. Their souls are where? With God. But one day there will be a resurrection. Not a resurrection of the soul. Soul's still alive. Soul's still going. It's a resurrection of the what? The body. To meet that soul once again. In fact, let's jump down to verse 35. But some man will say, how are the dead raised up? And with what body are they come? Right? So is it what goes in the ground? How many hope not? It's got to be better than that, right? <laughs> got to be better than that. Thou fool, that which thou sowest in is not quickened except it die. So you take a seed and, you know, you stick it in the ground, it's dead, but then it what? It germinates and... Brings forth life, right? And that which thou sowest, thou sowest not that body which shall be, but bare grain. It may chance of weed or some other grain, but God gives it a body as it hath pleased him, and to every seed his own body, right? So you take an apple seed, take it out of the apple, stick it in the ground, it germinates, and then it comes up, and what comes out of the ground? A bunch of apple seeds? That'd be pretty worthless. <laughs> so who would want to eat a bunch of apple seeds? Right, oh, I got 100 apple seeds. Woo! You want the fruit, right? And if you put an apple in, what's going to come out? An apple tree, right? If you put a watermelon seed, what will come? A watermelon tree, right? <laughs> or whatever they do. I'd like to see. <laughs> yeah, that'd be nice, wouldn't it? Verse 38, but God gives it a body as hath pleased him, right? So, And I love when the Bible does this. It's like, don't overthink it, people. I get these questions all the time. So if I die when I'm 10, will I be 10 years old forever? If I die as an infant, will I be infant? If, I, if I'm 81 when I die, <laughs> will I be 81 forever? Who decides all that? God does. Gives it a body as it pleases him. I may agree God is full of grace and mercy and love and it's going to get it all right. Absolutely. How tall will we be? How strong will we be? How much hair will we have? <laughs> <laughs> Who's going to decide all that? He will. he will. And we get a glimpse of it because even Jesus Christ, who's, what did his body look like when it went in the ground? Beaten beyond recognition as a human being, but even as that body came out before it was glorified, how did it look? Good. Was it recognizable? Not what they were expecting, <laughs> but recognizable with the scars, right, and you know the holes and things like that. But still, it was, it was him, right? Physical, strong. And then in John, in the Book of Revelation, John sees the glorified Christ. Looks very different, right? But God will decide that. How many are going to trust God on this? Absolutely. I'm sure he can do a lot better than I could. <laughs> Coming up with what we should all look like, right? 
and every seed his own body, right? So basically that soul will be reunited with a glorified body, and it will last forever, right? And that's the important part, verse 42. So also is the resurrection of the dead. It is sown in corruption. It is raised in what? In corruption. corruption. What does it mean by corruption? Well, how many of us are falling apart? (laughs) How many of us have been corrupted by sin? How many of us have a reprobate mind? (laughs) How many of us are, you know, just, we're a mess, right? And how long has that been going on? Yeah. Been going on, but the body that comes out is incorruptible, cannot give in to sin, cannot fall apart, <laughs> cannot do those things. Incorruption is raised in incorruption. Verse 43 it is sown in dishonor, it is raised in what glory. When the body dies, they may have died in an honorable way, but the body is what. It's a good for. <laughs> in fact, I always love uh, when he raised uh, Lazarus from the dead. He'd been in the in the tomb for four days, and already the people said, "What? We don't want to look at him. He stinks." <laughs> yeah. Right? The, the whole this body, which you know, we put so much effort in, you know, make it look pretty and <laughs> oh, good. Put all this effort into it. It, it really is not that impressive. <laughs> <laughs> in its current state. It's sown in dishonor, but it is raised in what? Glory. Glory to who? God. Glory to God. It is sown in weakness. Is there anything weaker than something that's dead? Yeah. No, it's hard to come up with them. <laughs> <laughs> what can dead bodies do? Nothing. Nothing. Right. Stink. It is raised in what? Power. So when Jesus says, I will raise up, it's not raising up zombies, right? Not raising up things that could then go back, right? It's not like Lazarus. It's not like that boy we talked about today who was on that beer, and right? Hey, we're talking about what? Not raising from the dead to die again. <laughs> raising from the dead to sin again. Raising from the dead to be weak again, we are to be raised from the dead to what? Eternal glory, immortality, and just life forever. I mean, I think that's a great deal. Yes. When you really think about that, what, what kind of promise is this? I will raise up each one to his glory forever and ever. I'm mean, looking forward to that day. Absolutely. So yes, death is difficult here because these bodies go in the hole and we've separated from each other, but is it really that big a deal in the scheme of eternity? Yes. Because if we know Jesus Christ our Savior for eternity, we will what? Be with him. In fact, how does it all play out? Starting in verse 50 of 1 Corinthians chapter 15. <coughs> Now this I say, brethren, that flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God, neither does corruption inherit incorruption, right? So we've got to get rid of this mortal body, this mortality, this corruption. That that has to go away, right? And that's not a physical thing. That is a spiritual thing, right? It can only be done spiritually in Christ. Behold, I show you a mystery. How many like mysteries? (laughs) Ah, this is a mystery. We shall not all sleep but we shall all be changed. Because we know that when Jesus Christ comes in the clouds, not all the way down here to Armageddon and all that stuff, when he comes in the crowd, clouds and the rapture happens, there will be people still alive, Christians still alive. And they will be caught up, right? That's what rapture means. So I'm looking forward to that. I mean, that would be nice to not ever have to die. That would be awesome. <laughs> But there's no guarantee, you know. But my grandfather was always like, yeah, I'm, 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 it's going to happen in my lifetime. It's going to happen in my lifetime. It's going to happen in a lifetime. But if it doesn't, it'll happen later. <laughs> That's the best way. Because it is going to what? Happen because he says what? I will. <laughs> right? And we'll all be changed in a moment. In the twinkling of an eye. How important is that? 
It's not like God's like, okay, you were dead. So after years of physical therapy, medicines, working out, eventually I'll get you to the place where you'll be worth something. It's not even like a child, right? Anya's amazing. But she's what? Nearly worthless in so many ways. <laughs> so many things she cannot do for herself. And it's not like that. I'm going to raise you up and do something i got to train and help. And Twinkly and I, we will be automatically turned into this glorious, immortal, incorruptible, wonderful glory of God. Isn't that not, a, not a process, right? Not evolution. <laughs> God does things like what? Yes. God at the very beginning said, let there be light, and there was what? Light. And he said, let there be sun, moon, and stars, and there was what? Sun, moon, and sun, moon, and stars. Can he change us like that? It's like the eye. Even faster than a blink. It will happen. At the last trump, for the trumpet shall sound, and the dead shall be raised incorruptible, and we shall be changed. So the dead in Christ rise first. I personally believe that includes everybody throughout all of history. We're talking about Adam and Eve and Abel. Abel being the first oldest. He's the deadest of them all. <laughs> Who had his faith in the coming Christ, right? Job, David. Moses, Abraham, all those, all of them were looking forward to the Christ. They all died in Christ. They were, all their souls were in paradise until Christ died and then preached to them, and they all went to heaven, right? Their souls are waiting for the day when they will be reunited with their bodies. They rise first, and then all the rest of us will be changed. So they get to go first. Everybody okay with that? That's okay. They've been waiting, you know. <laughs> poor people. For this corruptible must put on incorruption, and this mortal must put on immortality. How many immortals do we have here today? Mm -hmm. They're immortal. Now our souls are all immortal. All souls are immortal. Mm -hmm. I've always looked at that. We we got our life. We got our soul. We got our being because God breathed into us, right? Yes. And what he breathed into us is eternal, because he is eternal, right? But this body, he says, I need something better, <laughs> right? Because of sin. Originally, that was his plan. Adam and Eve was just live for what? Ever. Sure. All of them live forever. Everybody's lived forever. Everything would have been great, but we messed up. Because of sin, there is death. But he says, I can fix that. And he fixed that through who? Jesus, Jesus Christ. The one who says, I will raise up. I myself will raise up as the first fruits, and then in the last days I will raise you all up. And you will all be changed. Verse 54. So when this corruptible shall have put on incorruption, and this mortal shall have put on immortality, then shall be brought to pass the saying that is written, Death is swallowed up in victory. Death is destroyed. Death will be no more. That's Usually the two greatest fears of people are public speaking and death, right? And what, third, taxes? The 15th, yeah. <laughs> so, yeah, I mean, that's fear, 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 but death is gone. When Jesus Christ brings us back to life, right? And then we will say what? O oh, death, where is thy sting? O oh, grave, where is thy victory? The sting of death is sin. And the strength of sin is the law. If we were still under the law, if we, we still had to earn our salvation, there would be no hope and there would be only death. But thanks be to who? God. God, which giveth us the victory through Lord Jesus. What's his last name? Christ. 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 <laughs> the Christ. I mean, the one who was promised from the very beginning to overturn the curse, he is the one who will what? Bring us back to life. And give us that life, and we will live forever with him. First, a thousand years on this earth, with him as king, as we've learned in the millennium. And then what? A new heaven, a new earth, a new Jerusalem, and with him forever and ever and ever. And our minds can think of the concept, but <laughs> to really grasp it. And I think with even resurrection, we have a hard time really grasping what it will be like. 
How awesome is it going to be? How great will it be? Just to be free from all the physical things, <laughs> all the physical limitations, all of the spiritual limitations, all gone, and to be only one with God forever and ever and ever. That's what he promised. Now, before we leave this and go to verse 58, we also need to remember, will there also be a resurrection of those who aren't in Christ? Yes. yes. And that's where it gets sad. Because as we know from the book of Revelation, hell will give up its dead. The sea will give up its dead. The graves will give up their dead. And their souls will be reunited with immortal bodies that will be cast into the lake of fire. And that's not good. Is that what God wants? No. That's why he sent his son to die for us. <laughs> it's not what he wants, but will he actually do that? Yes. He says, I will. Right? When he says, I will raise up, he will raise up himself, he will raise up his children, but he will also raise up those unto eternal condemnation, those who have rejected his love and his grace and his mercy. Which makes it even more important for us to go out and tell people what? The good news. The gospel, which is how we started, First Corinthians, right? Chapter 15. I we are out there telling people the gospel, the gospel that Jesus Christ died for their sins, was buried, and is what? Risen again, and is the first fruits of all who believe in him, and you will have eternal life through him if you just put your faith in him to forgive your sins. Is that is that the gospel? Is it really that easy? Yes, it is. Why is this promise so important? Well, it gives us hope, doesn't it? Yes. But it also gives us purpose, doesn't it? Mm -hmm. Look at verse 58. What's the rule in the Bible? If anybody writes about uh, the future and heaven and resurrection and things like that, they also have to talk about, okay, in the meantime. <laughs> right? Between now and that happening, what do we do? Verse 58, therefore... My beloved brethren, be steadfast, unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord. Eternal life is ahead of us. Glorification is in front of us. We have that hope of eternal life with him because he says, I will. Right? In the meantime, what should we be doing? His will. Living as a living sacrifice unto him day after day after day, doing his work, sacrificing for him, you know, all of those things. And will we fail at that at times? Yes. Will he forgive? Absolutely. Will he help us when we are weak? Yes. Will he prop us up when we need it? Yes. He will do all those things. He will get us there. He will finish his work in us, right? Well, we got we to gotta keep at it. And what keeps us going? For as much as you know that your labor is not in vain in the Lord. <laughs> he said earlier, hey, if Jesus Christ isn't from risen from the dead, then everything's in vain. But Jesus Christ is risen, and you have eternal life. Therefore, everything you do has what? Purpose. Has value. So it'll be worth it. Me personally, that's one of the things I, I just... Irritates me to no end is when I'm doing something that I know at the end of the day means nothing. <laughs> it happens. You know, I had a project like that or something at work, and I'm like, just like, you know what? This is just busy work. This is just not going to do it. This is going to fail. It's, I just, you know, forget it. I don't like that. I like wasting time. Time's very valuable to me. <laughs> I, got lot, I got a lot to do. What's God saying right here? Is it ever a waste of time to live for God? No. Is it ever a waste of effort to sacrifice for him? No. Is it ever a waste of time to show our love to him and love others and live? You know? No, no, it's, it's never. It's always worth it because why? We know that there is eternity, right? And God will be this. And we will be with him forever. And he will reward yes. our work here. Won't he? Yes. He says, I will. Do you believe him? Yes. Yes. So, what we're tonight, first statement we're looking at is, I will raise up. He himself raised up as he said he would, which is an amazing 
amazing thing. <laughs> it's proving he is God, proving he's in control, but also he will raise us up and we will be with him forever. So that gives us hope and he gives us purpose, right? Any questions? All right, let's pray.